everyone for joining us uh, for this Masterclass today. I'm Lolly Newsom, and I'm really excited to welcome you all to AMP Online Masterclasses sponsored by the Chestnut Family Foundation. This class is on scales and techniques for advanced violin. This is part one of a four-part class that will take place over four weeks um, on Tuesday evenings at 5 p.m. If you are a musician and you're listening in, I invite you to participate by playing along at home and answering questions in the chat. Um, there is also a question and answer function. I hope you all enjoy the class. And if you have any questions at any point during the class, you can throw them in the chat or in the question and answer session. But take it away, Grace. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Lolly. Hi, my name is Grace, um, and I'll be teaching uh, the first master class. So I want to start off by playing something in G major. Everybody. So we have a lot of time since it's the coronavirus pandemic and I thought what better time than now to revisit some basics. Um, I'm going to be moving pretty quickly through the basics and aim to get to some scales at the end. But before I start, um, I want to talk about moving your big muscles and going down to smaller muscles. So the first thing that I would love to talk about is your, your stance from your big body standing. So right now you can't see my feet, but my feet are about shoulder width apart and I'm feeling very balanced. So if you pushed me, I wouldn't fall. I feel very comfortable. Um, and I know as violinists, sometimes we lean on one hip because we're standing. Um, I would like to not do that. And if you had a foot that you feel more strongly about, I would lean more um, on your left left foot than your right foot. That gives you like a very good strong stance when you're playing. Now, I know this might seem very basic to all of you. I know you guys have been playing violin for a while and um, that's really fantastic. But I want to go ahead and do some really quick uh, playing position exercises with you. So this is just like doing some exercises. We're going to do some reps of holding the violin. So I'd like you to put your, violin, uh, put your bow down and hold up your violin. So we're going to um, set our violin into playing position about five times. And in doing so, you're going to find your most natural, comfortable playing position for the violin. So I want to be pretty centered, pretty straight, and relaxed, shoulders up and down. So you're going to shrug them up and just let them set down. OK, so ready? One, two, three, four, five. So while I'm doing this, you can see that my face is pretty straight. I don't want to do something like this. I don't want to do something like this. So you want to keep your head nice and straight. Now we're going to put our violin down. And we're going to do some sets of holding the bow. Before I do this, I just want you to see where my contact point is with the bow. So on my bow hand, my first finger, I have drawn a little line there. That line is the point of contact where I'd have this, holding that. Okay. So you want to hold your bow with your left hand, shake your hand out, and just plop it on. Adjust your thumb, adjust your pinky. So that's one. Two. You can adjust those things. Three. Four. 
five. Another really good thing to do with this while you have, um, while you don't have the violin or even with the violin, just tapping on your index finger or your pinky or your thumb really helps to loosen out your hand. And that's really beneficial. All right. So next we're going to talk about our playing frame with our, both of our arms and our instrument. So I had a professor in, in undergrad. I, I used to have a very wide set violin stance uh, going into school, but he helped me discover that I'm, it's more beneficial for, for me to hold it a little bit more tighter in. Not like this, not like this, but right here. So a good way to find that place is by standing straight, um, having your arms straight out, and trying to meet in the middle. So let's do five of those. So that was one, two, three, four, five. Now I am not tall, I'm not short, I'm kind of on the shorter side, I'm five four. So um, this is a great place for me to have my violin. If I'm taller, usually that means that I would have longer arms um, and your stance would be slightly a little bit wider if you're looking from a bird's eye view down. So I have some troubleshoots that can help you find your right space also. So um, when you're playing, you wanna utilize the whole bow from the frog to the tip. Now, I would like to be able to play and reach the tip and you can see that I still have a slight bend in my, in my elbow. This helps me um, be able to play different kinds of articulations at the tip. If I wanted to tap, something quiet, something loud, I have that control. I feel like if my arm was, was totally locked up like this and straight, I don't have the flexibility that I want to do what I want to specifically create. So first of all, let's see if we can get to the tip and still have a slight bend. If you're too close, I, you don't want to be centered. You don't want to be too wide. This is a good test to see if you're too wide. See, my arm is pretty straight. Um, and you want to be able to make a, a pretty much a box in the middle when you're set at the middle of the bow. All right. So with that aside, um, I want to move into holding the violin. So I have a really silly exercise that I go with some of my students, um, but I find that it's very beneficial to everybody. So it's called the hello exercise, and some of you have heard me do this and have done it with me. Thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to put our violin in playing position. And you can see my hand is in front of my face, and my wrist is straight. So I want you to go ahead and say hello. You want to wiggle your fingers. You want to have a straight wrist. I know you guys aren't little kids, so I'm telling you the reason why we're doing this. You want to have a straight wrist, spaces in your fingers, wiggling, they're relaxed. And then I want you to rotate from your wrist. Okay, that looks more like playing position. Say hello to your fingerboard. Wiggle, 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 spaces. Um, I often see students having like a lobster claw or like a crab hand. You don't want to do that. that that's that already looks tense, I feel tense. You wanna have those spaces in there. So you can just do a few of those. And it takes like half a second to do it, right? Okay. All right, so we're gonna visit um, this idea about hand frame again later on. I'm going to move on to creating a beautiful tone. So I want you to think for a few seconds, I'll give you about five seconds, I want you to think about what it means to create a beautiful tone. I want you to give me some adjectives. Um, what does a beautiful tone sound like? And if you wanna utilize the chat, um, please go ahead. So I'll wait five seconds and continue. Um, yeah, go ahead and throw some words in the chat. Um, what words you would use to describe a beautiful tone? We've got from Landon, we've got emotion. It's a great one. Dynamic. Okay. Good. Consistency. Balance. I like that consistency and balance. It's nice. Okay. 
Good. So um, those are some really great words. I love the word consistent. Uh, we want to play things consistently or have the control to be able to do that. Um, sustain comes to my mind, even, smooth, full. Um, so we want to translate that into a physical idea. And before we do that, let's just have an example of a nice, sustained, even, consistent note. So in order to achieve that, um, we're doing a few things. Mainly we're um, learning how to control the bow. And so under controlling the bow, that would mean, um, you, you would notice that my bow is at a 90 degree angle to the string. That's gonna help a lot. As opposed to. You hear that skating sound. I'm consistently staying um, at, at a sound point that I chose right at the middle. Um, and there's different sound points and we'll go into that. Um, I'm balancing gravity. So what are tips on trying to keep the boat 90 degrees? This is an excellent question. So um, right now I have the benefit of having FaceTime and I can see that it, I'm looking at my um, image, keeping it straight. So that's one thing. So you can uh, look off of a computer or what I do is I look, I practiced looking at a mirror. Um, so if that means go, go to your bathroom and do this in front of your bathroom or into your uh, bedroom and do this in front of your dresser. If you don't have one, I have this TV behind me and you can kind of see a reflection. So anything that gives you a reflection, that's gonna help you. It is a little bit odd to look at your reflection and do something and change your movement. So that just takes a really little learning curve, but you'll get the hang of it. There are some other tips. Um, I know it feels slightly like you're going cross-eyed, but you can look down at your, your strings and your sounding point and you can, lightly gauge the distance. I'm looking like down here and I'm looking, am I, is my bow an equal distance away from the bridge? So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that and if it looks like that, I know it's off. Um, another thing is sound. Your sound will guide you. So if you're skating a lot, that means your bow is not at a 90 degree angle. Another thing that I want to say, when you're looking at a mirror or a reflection doing this, you want to basically be like doing it like yoga. You want to, you want to like really feel how you feel at every part of the bow, whether, whether you're like this at the frog, how does your upper arm feel? How does your forearm feel? How does your hand feel? How do they look? And just memorize like how your muscle memory is feeling at each point of the bow. Because it feels different here, feels different here, feels different here. Um, some, other, um, some other things some students have said or I've seen is that they're, they're often swinging their arms. So this might feel straight, but it's definitely not straight. So you're up here, you wanna break it down and we'll do an exercise of breaking down um, quarters of the bow, so that'll be helpful. But here, we look like this. At the frog, we're gonna move this back. And by the, by the point, by the middle point, you stop moving your forearm, um, your upper arm. You move this out. And then you go up at the middle, and you start using this. So you might want to practice. With breaks in the middle and breaking things down into chunks really helps you to go in deeper. Um, something else you want to think about is even speed of weight. I mean, even speed and weight. So sometimes you'll have students who have a burst of energy at the frog or burst of energy at the tip. And it sounds like this. And that might sound familiar to some of you guys. So what you want to do is maintain that speed. Okay. 
So no sudden bursts of energy or movement. So now that you hear that, that's going into your like sound repertory or your, your hearing, you're becoming um, more critical listeners. So when you hear something like a jab of sound, that should translate to you, oh, I just moved a lot faster than I intended to. So that means you have to be very picky about how you're moving your bow speed. Another thing, you guys all know that the frog is a lot heavier than the tip. So we wanna do some control or manipulating of the weight and balance. So when you're at the frog, you wanna suspend more, not press down so much and not use your weight so much. And as you approach the tip, you wanna lean into your sound a little bit more. And then you're leaning in and as you approach the frog, you wanna lean out a little bit. So I'm gonna demonstrate something for you, not changing my weight at all. It got heavier as I got to the frog, it got lighter as I got to the tip. So knowing that I'm going to lighten up at the frog, lean in more, and gradually lean out. So I'm hoping that if I were in a sound recording booth and you could see like the decibels of sound going on, it was pretty much like a solid brick. And I like to think about making solid bricks of vanilla sound. I use vanilla because it's very, it might be boring, but it's like your most basic ice cream flavor. And from there you can build onto chocolate or mint chocolate chip or banana or whatever. Um, so I'm interested in making a consistent, beautiful sound first. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is control of bow usage and distribution. So you can see um, I used the whole bow. Um, that's what I wanted to use at that time, but we want to know how to sustain and create beautiful sounds at all parts of the bow. So moving on, um, we're going to get our violins now. So getting into playing position, another thing I wanted to mention before we go into heavily into the bow arm is that uh, when, we're when we're learning the violin, sometimes we'll, we'll, we want to get really into it and we're moving. Um, when you're learning a piece or trying to uh, solidify your foundation, I would highly recommend keeping this stable and not moving. When it's moving around, you, you have like a moving target and you're making it harder for your bow arm. I would say let's try to master having a, a, a steady frame first. And when you feel more comfortable with your technique, um, however the music moves you um, and however you feel inspired, that's, that's fine. So a really simple way of doing this is to look at your practice space and find an object or point on the wall where your scroll lines up. So mine is like at the corner of a window right now. So my aim is to just keep that there. Um, if you want to, you can take a piece of paper and draw a bullseye target on it and put it on your music stand. And there you go. So your aim is just to keep it there. All right, so I wanna start off with the feeling of pulling and pushing. I know we have down bow and up bow. Um, I really want you to feel the pull and push. So with your hands only, um, sorry, I lied. We're not gonna use your violin right now. Hold your bow with your violin hand. You can have this here. I want you to pull this away from your hand. Okay. You can see that this wrist is getting activated, it's going down. I know we don't play the violin like this, but I'm trying to exaggerate how we're moving. Now I want you to push this way. So that moves up. So you're activating this as well. So realistically, we're, we're gonna move a little bit like that. Okay, hope you guys are trying this at home too. And you can tell that my wrist and my fingers are relaxed. Now, we're gonna do this with the bow. We're gonna air violin. So I'm gonna go down bow. As you can see, my wrist is a little bit uh, bent over here. I'm gonna go down bow. It's pretty flat. It's going down to the tip. And it's a little bit bent this way. I feel like everyone's pretty good at doing this, but going back to the frog, some people might forget to activate this up again. So um, 
a really good exercise to do that to make sure that your back of the hand is straight is you can get a quarter you can put it on your on the back of your hand you're going to start at the I'd probably aim for the A string or the D string The aim is to keep that quarter on your hand. Um, you can use a bigger circular thing with more surface area if you feel like that's falling off. Um, another way to get that nice action, a feeling of pulling and pushing. Okay, I warn you guys, you might want to turn your sound a little lower because this is not going to sound pretty. If you can put your violin bow on the string and use your other hand, and press it down so that it stays firmly there. And now you're going to try pulling down. I told you it doesn't sound pretty, but it really gets that feeling of pulling down. And now, yay, we get to go up bow, so we're going to push up. I know, it's beautiful. So you can try this a few times, and that's going to hopefully get you get that feeling moving. Um, and now when you try that, feels so much nicer and sounds so much nicer. Okay, so I hope that quarter trick is um, helpful for a lot of you guys. It was very helpful for me when I was learning. Um, the next thing is that we want to produce a consistent tone um, using uh, speed, pressure, and contact point. So um, those three things for sound, for, for creating a nice tone, it's, it's like a recipe. You, you need all three. You need a combination of the three of those and you need to give or take and balance correctly with them. So if I, so speed, pressure or weight and contact point. Um, if I want something with a lot of speed, if that's my main ingredient, I wanna use less pressure. So more speed usually means less pressure. So let's try that. Let's um, have a medium contact point right here. So lots of speed, less pressure. Okay, we're gonna change that now. So why don't you guys go ahead and try that. Um, try something with fast speed, less pressure. I'll do that with you. Now let's use something with less speed, a slower speed, but more weight, okay? And because I feel like we are sound scientists, you can go ahead and experiment what it sounds like to mess up those ingredients. Like what happens if you use a lot of speed and a lot of pressure? Um, let's see that, let's do that at a contact point close to the bridge. A lot of speed and a lot of weight. Okay, that sounds funky. And then if you do it here at the fingerboard. Oh my, that does not sound good. So you want to experiment what, what um, ratio of the recipe works really well for the sound that you want to achieve. So um, I feel like when we start playing the violin, we're pretty comfortable playing close to the fingerboard. That's, that's the easiest place and also somewhere close to the middle of the sounding point. So just to review that, this is the fingerboard. Um, Playing close to the fingerboard sounding point gives you like a piano, mezzo piano dynamic. So it's on the quieter range. As we move to the middle sound, sounding point, that's like a nice healthy mezzo forte. And as we get closer to the bridge right here, that's where we have the dynamics of forte, fortissimo, something very strong. Um, and then we know as we get to the bridge, then we have ponticello, that's another type of articulation. So let's not play exactly at the bridge. Um, 
I don't know if some of you find it challenging to uh, stay at a consistent contact point. Um, the best way to do that is, I feel like, to be like Yoda and just, you just have to be very focused on keeping your bow there. So I would look down your finger board, board um, pick a place, pick the middle, that's a good one to start with, and just follow your bow. <laughs> and really commit yourself to a contact point. And guys, I know that I'm playing on the A string, but when I do these exercises and when you practice them at home, please go through all of, all of your strings um, to feel comfortable on all of them. Now, I wanna talk about getting towards a louder contact point. I feel like in my development, that was a more difficult contact point to stay connected to. So I wanna try an exercise. I'll demonstrate it first and then ask some of you guys to try that. So I'm gonna start at the middle, and in each bow, I'm gonna to edge towards the bridge, or edge closer towards the bridge. So I'm gonna do like one, one, two, and I'm exaggerating here, one, two, three, and then four, five, six, seven, eight. So here, I'll, I'll go with that now. That's one, and I'm gonna go for two nudges. I'm gonna go for three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. And then you're going to just try to commit to a sound point very close to the bridge and stay that way. Um, is there anybody um, on, on the Zoom chat that would like to demonstrate this exercise? Yeah, we've got several students who... Do you want just one student? Um, or more. Is anybody willing to try? Could you raise up your hand? Yeah, yeah. Um, put your Landon okay. will do it. Awesome. Landon and Donovan. I'm gonna. I'll do Landon first, and then okay. Donovan wants to do it. Fantastic. Let's see, Landon. I have to share my video. All right. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi, Landon. Landon, could you? Let's see. You're sideways. Is there a way you oh, can? Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. Good. I had to unplug the small. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the exercise is to try the different lanes and see what the best contact point is, correct? Yeah. So we're going to start um, at the middle contact point and we're going to edge towards the bridge. So you're going to one, okay. one, Two. Yep, and you're gonna go away. So you're gonna approach the bridge, go away. Okay, so I'm gonna be a little bit more specific. We're gonna um, stay at the middle sound point, and as we go down the bow, we're gonna just visit the bridge once. We're gonna go visit and go back. And you're going to try okay. to keep your sound the same, and then you're going to try to do one, two. Okay. Good. And now we're going to try to do two of those in one bow. Okay. Yep. Um, and you don't want to go totally right beside the bridge, or else you'll get a ponticello sound. So you want to be like probably right there, okay? Okay. And then now let's try to do three. Okay. Okay. And now can you try to do four? So you want to move it a little faster now. Not your bow, but visiting the bridge. Yes, ma'am.
And now can you put five of them in there? Good. Yeah, I can tell that you're noticing you want to move it a little faster now because as the, you get to the bridge, you're like, uh-oh, I'm running out of space, right? Mm -hmm. You think you can put six of them in there. So let's try to put three in the lower half and three in the upper half. Yes, ma'am. Good. You're doing really well for doing this exercise for the first time. Do you think you can go for seven? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it'll get easier as you do this exercise more and more. Um, let's do eight. So you want to quickly visit. You don't want to get too far into the middle now. You want to stay closer to the neighborhood. And they're really quick mm. to the bridge. Yes, ma'am. Cool. Now I want you to commit to a, a sounding point that's quite close to your bridge, not on it, but right beside, and stay mm. there from the frog to the tip. Excellent. Okay, so that was a really good demonstration. Thank you, Landon. That was awesome. No Thank good you. to see you. Um, good to see so you I, thanks. So I love how you commit how Landon committed to staying there all the way from the frog, all the way from the middle to the tip. It's like driving in one lane. You don't want to be a swerver on the highway. You want to like pick a lane and just go there uh, and just drive there. Yeah, in your music, sometimes you're gonna have to change lanes. Um, but if you're going for, if you're practicing this on open strings, commit to one lane. Or if you're changing lanes, be aware that you're doing that on purpose. Okay, so um, another thing I want to talk about are smooth bow changes. I know I'm jumping a little bit, but we talked about using even speed and even weight. And in Landon's demonstration, I saw him do, using a really nice even speed. So his car was going really nicely down the street. Excellent job. So if you hear something again, that's, those are not um, smooth bow changes. You wanna hide your bow changes. You don't wanna be telling people like, hey guys, I'm going up bow, I'm going down bow now. Um, a good exercise is to close your eyes, and you, you guys can all do this also, um, and try to play some open strings or just one, one note and try to hide your bow changes. So it's kind of like starting a car or going in reverse. reverse. So you don't want to slam on your gas when you're, when you're changing directions. Um, it, you want to make it as smooth as possible. So um, something I would like to go into now is uh, bow division. Um, and in future videos, I want to talk about bow management or bow distribution and some etudes that we're going to do. But right now, as we're um, trying it on open strings, I want to talk about bow division. So, man, oh man, I know it's been years since you guys had like a middle tape on your bow. But sometimes it's not a bad idea to do that. So I have a, a sticky post-it note. So I want you guys to look at your bow and figure out where your middle is roughly. So you can do this with a string or a post-it note or a rubber band. It's just something to like visually show you where, where your middle is. Um, so we're going to do that. And I have a metronome here. Y'all should have a metronome. And it's set at 60. Um, so what I want to do is, first of all, divide it into two.
Okay. So now let's divide it into four. So you're gonna look at your bow, you're gonna divide it into quarters with your eyeballs. And if you wanna put more tapes, go for it. So now we're gonna put four beats in this bow. So we're gonna play quarter bow each note. Four. When you do the quarter, you're going to realize where, which quadrant you have a habit of using more bow in. Sometimes you might discover, oh, I'm using a lot of bow in my frog, or, oh, I didn't realize that I'm moving my up bows really fast. So that really shows you um, where, where you're giving and pulling, and what you want to do is even it out in the end. Um, and you can really tell that by smoothing it out. So now let's smooth it out and do four beats again, but with no stops. You can do that with all of your bows, uh, all of your strings. So you can gradually expand it. We're going to jump a little bit and expand it to eight beats. So let's set our metronomes on and let's all do eight beats. Okay, here we go. So we're going to move double slow, right? So what you realized with eight beats, I had four and four. Now we're gonna go for 16 beats. So that means we're gonna have eight beats and another eight beats, okay? I hope you're doing this because after I do this, I kinda of wanna have a competition to see who can do this the longest. And as you can tell, I'm having a continuous sound, no breaks, here we go. All right. Um, who would like to try this? You want to raise up your hands? Or oh, God. we have Donovan. multiple people? Donovan's going to join. We've All right. Got, I'm going to get Julian, Landon. Let's see. Where's uh, Julian? There he is. Julian. Okay, let's um, let's have some healthy competition up in here then. Yeah. Um, oh, you guys are uh, Donovan is sideways. There you go. Perfect. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everybody. Um, let's see. For those of you listening in, um, these four students are um, violinists in our senior youth orchestra. Yeah. So. I want you all to have a healthy like starting point. So I'm going to have my metronome on and I'm going to count you off. So I'm example it's going to be like one, two, three, four, play. Okay. Can you guys all hear this beat by the way? Join it louder. Yeah. Uh, yes, I can hear it. I can hear it. Okay. Here we go. So you want to set your boat the frog to have like the most possible. Here we go. So one, two, three, four, go. Landon's oh, sweet. Uh. Awesome. 
Okay, okay. so we had some folks go from like almost 20 beats. Um, that's great. I think 20 is really hard. But okay, so the great thing is that uh, you want to try to do this down bow, up bow, try it on all of your different strings. Your E string is going to be um, a really different feel compared to your G string. Um, and I think a great benefit of this is, is really knowing intimately at each point of your bow what it feels like to play. Okay? Um, continue, practice, do like maybe like four of these, like one, two, three, four. And then if you go back to like eight beats per bow or four beats per bow, I think it helps me with even my fast bows and my slow bows. So you're gonna feel better and better about your bow usage. Okay. Thank you guys for participating in that competition. Yeah. I, thought, I thought that was really fun. Yeah, keep practicing. Um, maybe we can start next next week's video with, with some slow bows. Okay, mm. so I told you that I would, um, oh yeah, just to go over arm and string levels also, a great way to troubleshoot is, while I still have my middle flag thing on, um, put your bow at the middle on each string. So E string, if you put at the middle, um, my hand and my elbow are parallel to the ground. And as you move up to the A, it, both of them raise up. As you get to the D string, the G string. You don't want this situation to happen at the G string or the D string. And when you're at the E string, you don't want this situation to happen, right? Or even at the G, you don't want you don't want to use um, more than you need, and you don't want to use less than you need. Okay, so another exercise that I want to get into about your hand frame, um, which I said that we would get back into, um, we're going to talk about hand frame and intonation, because those two are very uh, related. If your hand frame is off, your intonation will be off and vice versa. So let's try the hello exercise. Great, and you notice that I have spaces in my fingers. Um, so what I wanna try is doing. So I used open G, one, D, one, A, one, E, one. Um, you know that the violin looks similar to the guitar. There, we share a lot of similarities, but we don't have a fret. So your fret is inside your head and inside your muscle memories for your fingers. So um, I know you guys all feel very comfortable in first position, which is why I want you to feel super grounded in your intonation at first position. So after you do your first finger, you want to um, follow with your second finger. Something else I want you to realize is my my forearm is not really changing drastically from the E string to the, to the G string. And you're going to do it with your third finger, so let's all do that together. with a drone or you can use open strings um, so there are lots of apps on, on the phone that you can download for free or if you have a metronome and a tuner you can just have it going on while you're doing that if you don't have that you can still do it with your violin want to find where that pitch is matching um, and just to give you a hint when when something is is pretty close but it's not matching it the sound will will you will hear you hear that, that sound but when it matches 
We don't hear that. So make sure you're listening very intently and honestly. So um, I want to play G major one octave and I want to move into the three octave scales soon afterwards. But um, while we're doing G, G major one octave, I want you to listen very closely with a drone or practice with um, your open strings. While we're doing that. Um, I think we're, we're almost out of time. Um, okay. It's 45 minutes, but yeah, you can go ahead and play. You're good. Okay. I'll, I'll finish up real fast. Um, speaking about your uh, hand frame, you want to make sure that your fourth finger um, is not like curled underneath or piggybacking on your third finger or somewhere, I don't know, sticking up. Try to have it hovering above your fourth finger spot where you need that. So. Okay, so next week um, we'll jump into our three octave scales. Um, I'd love to have some demonstrations uh, from students um, as we get a grasp on intonation um, and dealing, talking about shifting and articulation um, and talking about the broad window management in the future. But thank you um, everyone for joining in and I hope you guys are practicing hard during this quarantine. Sorry, I'm muted. Thank you so much, Grace, for doing this. It's a really wonderful class and super helpful. Um, if you are listening or if you want to share this uh, class with someone, if you want to share this class with someone you know, um, this will be posted on our YouTube channel. The recording will, um, so you can share it away. Um, we also have some more master classes coming up tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, our tuba teaching artist Casey Forbes is teaching a tuba master class and at 5 p.m. Our, our clarinet teaching artist Ricky Salcedo is teaching a clarinet master class. Um, all of these master classes can be found on our email blast and also on our Facebook page. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this class. These this, this class is part of our um, AMP Masterclass series sponsored by the Chestnut Family Foundation. Um, thank you to our performers today, Halal, Julian, Donovan, Landon. Thank you so much, Grace. And this class is one part one of four, so there will be three more weeks of this class, same place, same time, same week, um, Tuesday at 5 p.m. to 5 p.m. Thank you so much, Grace. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Thank you. Have a great time. You too. Bye, everybody. Thank you.